If you got your Bible, we're going to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, one verse of scripture. Verse number 8. If you're able to stand, we ask you to stand out of honor and reverence to the author of the scripture. Philippians chapter 3, verse number 8. Thank you all so much. Philippians chapter 3, verse number 8. The word of the Lord reads, Indeed, I count everything as a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord for his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ somebody say amen to the reading of God's word this morning we're going to teach we're going to preach with this thought in our hearts and our minds we are in part four of our follow me jesus do you follow me do you know jesus series uh today from the topic i've got nothing to lose i've got nothing to lose we have looked at for for uh, an extended period of time uh, you quickly know that this apostle paul has a love affair with this church of philippi uh, he actually uh, started this church, founded this church on his second missionary journey. It was him and a brother by the name of Silas that was making up their mind and they had their focus to be able to go to another place. They wanted to carry the gospel to another part of the known world, but yet and still the apostle Paul had a dream. He had a vision actually. And here the Bible says in his vision he saw a man beckoning him to come to Macedonia to help, to help them. The Bible says that Paul assuredly gathered and he prayed and he wanted to see what this is what God wanted him to do and the Bible said God gave him confirmation they began to head to Philippi God sent the Apostle Paul to Philippi because there was individuals that was there that needed the Word of God they needed to be able to be connected to God and the proof is in the pudding because as soon as he got to the coast of Philippi the Bible says there was a woman by the name of Lydia whose heart was wide open and the Bible said not only did she receive the gospel not only did she get saved but her entire household got saved. Her entire household got to a place to where she began to honor God and her family began to honor God and not only did Lydia get saved but then because of the fact that they were following God guess what? There was some opposition there was some persecution the old enemy of our soul he does what he does and he did what he did he stirred up this young lady who had this demon. The Bible says she had a, a spirit of divination. She was a soothsayer, fortune teller. She was like many of the prophets and the prophetess that we have today because they'll have they'll be tapped into because they have a little gift or whatever and they'll take their gift and manipulate it and just to be able to get something from you they'll tell you what the last three digits of your card number is or tell you what your social security number is or tell you about this or tell you about that and yet and still is not to benefit the bible says prophecy is for edification prophecy is beneficial I believe in all of the gifts I believe in the prophetic I believe in all that that goes along but the point that I'm trying to make is you got to be careful who you're receiving the word of God from because individuals can have an ulterior motive it amazes me that we're so gullible it's so often times we just listen to everything people tell us and we reroute our entire life just based on what someone said and what they said does not even line up with the word of God but Paul wasn't like the New Testament church or not, not, not like 2022 20, believers because Paul the Bible says that that woman got on his last nerves and the Bible says that put it as Paul was walking the Bible says he turned around and he rebuked the spirit he rebuked the spirit and cast the devil up out of that woman he got Paul said I had all I can stands and I, I can't stands no more I'm preaching already because there's somebody that the devil is agitating you there's somebody the devil is aggravating you and here you keep talking about the devil you keep talking about how the devil bothering you the devil said I'm gonna die the devil say he gonna kill me the devil say this gonna happen the devil say that's gonna happen but then when you try to figure out what the Lord is saying. I don't know what God is saying. How is it that you can know so clearly everything the devil is doing and what the devil is saying and when we tell you, well, what does the Lord have to say on the matter? I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't know. And here, can I tell you that here, what, what am I saying? That so oftentimes we're dealing with things that we don't have to deal with. We're allowing things to be hovering over our home and hovering over our body and getting to a place where we're just succumbing to the circumstances instead of rising up in the spirit and speaking to that demon 
amen rising up in the spirit and speaking the word of the Lord rising up in the spirit and being who God called us to be because the apostle Paul got tired of the devil he got tired of the devil bothering him so he started bothering the devil do I got anybody in here that's tired of the devil bothering them so they're gonna stop bothering the devil the Bible says he cast out this demon and because of this how did I get life he got put in prison him and him and Silas went to prison and here the Bible says that at midnight Paul and Silas begin to pray and the Bible says that the prisoners heard them can I tell you that maybe just maybe you might be in your captivity you might be in your bondage just simply not for you oh but for the people that are there so when you let your light so shine they hear your praise they hear your worship they hear your testimony and the Bible says at midnight there was an earthquake and the Lord opened up the prison doors and Paul and Silas was set free and then because of their testimony because of their their fortification in the things of God the jailer that was there said what must I do what must I do to be saved so their souls wherever wherever God sends you there's going to be provision whatever it is that God tells you to do a thing oh can I tell you that if it's God's choice he's going to take care of the invoice if God, if it's God's will he said I'll take care of the bill that's always going to be proof in the pudding let me help you because many of us are chasing things and going after things and we're blaming it on the Lord you need to take a page out of Millie Vanilla and blame it on the rain I'm blaming on the Lord because can I tell you that whenever y'all don't know about Millie Vanilla I'm sorry y'all can I tell you that whenever it is that you blame things or you're in a place that you don't see any fruit you keep banging your head against the wall you keep on seeming like you're spinning in circles you're going down 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 digging yourself in a ditch maybe maybe the Lord didn't tell you to do what it is that you're desiring to do but the Bible says that Paul and Silas they got out but while they were there they established this local church and they had to go on about their business and now by the time that Paul writes back to this Philippian church he's in trouble again he's in prison again he because he's doing what God has called him to do there's always going to be some some trouble there's always going to be a dilemma let me help you because anytime you're following God there's always going to be situations things are always going to jump off you're looking for a place to where you won't struggle do we have to deal with the enemy you have to deal with this person deal with that no there's always going to be doing something whenever I'm walking with God whenever I'm flowing with God there's always going to be issues but I love the apostle Paul because in this book of Philippians he is teaching the Philippian church how to maintain their joy no matter the circumstances how to maintain who they are in the things of God regardless of what it is that they're going through and Paul is teaching the people of God how we can be able to live this life with all of the opposition with all of the trouble with all of the things that happen to you and I and yet still lift him up so by time we get to Philippians chapter 3 the apostle Paul is saying something to this Philippian church because oftentimes we feel as if because of where we are and because of what we have and because of what we've done that should exclude us from opposition and trouble but no Paul says something very key in Philippians chapter 3 verse 4 look what he said though I, I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh. I got confidence in the flesh also. Uh, he, he's, he's combating all these religious folk that are telling them that this is how things ought to be and this is how things ought to be and, and, and you ought to follow someone that, that, that is not going through. They're literally the assault on the apostle Paul was this because he was in prison and because he was going through things his opposers or those individuals that was enemies of the cross they were saying how is this a man of God? How is this somebody you following and he's in prison? How is this a man of God and he's going through something? How is this a man of God and he's experiencing what he's experiencing? And here can I tell you, my friend, that you got to be very, very careful for listening to the voices in the crowd, listening to all of the noise, because Paul is saying, I got some stuff that I've accomplished in my life as well. I got some things that I've done in my life as well, but I don't put no confidence in the flesh. He said, if anyone else thinks that he has reason for confidence in the flesh, Paul says what? I have more. It's on the screen. He says, I have more. If anybody thinks they have confidence in the flesh, he said, I have more. In other words, Paul says, God has brought me from somewhere. God has done something in my life. God has not brought me from, from obscurity, but no, God has been working with me. In, in other words, in order for you and, I, and you and I to have a real and a fresh relationship with God, you have to have a testimony. I, I don't know. Lord have mercy. Y'all must still think this Palm Sunday is something. 
come. I thought this was Resurrection Sunday. I, I, I'm trying to tell you that here is there anybody here that has that has a testimony? Paul is saying that I got a testimony. You want me to testify and talk about what it is that I've done? Listen to me, because they're trying to depump what the Paul what Paul is doing and depump the work of the Lord and depump what God is doing. Paul said, No, 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 no. I have I've attained some things. I've I've achieved some things in my walk with God. I've achieved the height of self righteousness. But at the end of the day, everything that I've done without Christ, at the end of the day, anything that I do in the world, it does not mean anything. Paul said, I've done some things, but what I'm doing right now, it, it, it is the best thing. And here oftentimes, <laughs> oftentimes in our walk with God, we equate our walk with God with things and circumstances. That, that's, that's my big point that I'm trying to make. And Paul, Paul is very clear of showing us what our life with Christ should look like. Here, And I think the best way for me to explain to you as we've been in this series about do you know Jesus, the best way to explain to you about how you and I ought to know the Lord Jesus Christ, I believe it is to show you what knowing Jesus is not. Is anybody listening to me? To show what following Jesus is not. Number one, knowing Jesus has nothing to do with the ceremony. Has nothing to do with the ceremony. Philippians 3, 5, he says, circumcised on the eighth day. Paul was said, I was circumcised on the right day. He says, he, I participated in this particular ceremony. And this, this, this ceremony was what authenticated me in being a, being a child of God. This is what ceremony authenticated me with having a privilege of having the right birth. Paul said, I participated in a, in a ceremony. What are you trying to say, bro, Pastor? Because a lot of times we like to equate who we are in the things of God and who we are as relates to being a child of God with a ceremony saying that I was baptized a particular way saying I'm a member of a particular church I'm a part of this movement this organization oh I'm I'm doing this and I'm doing that no whenever it is that someone asks you do you know the Lord Jesus Christ your first response should not be oh that you're a member of somebody church it has nothing to do with a ceremony and so many people point to a ceremony and they think because of this ceremony morning because of this time because one day way 25 years ago I came to the altar one day and gave the preacher my hand and the Lord my heart and I repeated a prayer I said Lord Jesus Lord Jesus come to my heart come on say my I, I said that and I've been living like hell ever since can I tell you that, that one ceremony that one little prayer you said don't mean oh y'all ain't gonna talk to me up in here y'all y'all ain't come for this today I see can, can I tell you that little prayer that little prayer that you said that don't mean that don't mean anything if you're not following after the Lord Jesus Christ it has nothing to do with a ceremony number two knowing Jesus Jesus had nothing to do with my race. Oh, Paul says, Philippians 3, 5, circumcised the eighth day of the people of Israel. Come on, Hebrew Israelites. Come on, folk who say we got to know we the true Jews and know we got to go back to our roots and say that we're this and say, I say root, go back to our root and say we, we're kings and we're queens and all that. And yeah, yeah, we are. But can I tell you, doesn't matter if I'm a true Jew, doesn't matter if I'm an African and African American, doesn't matter if I'm Swahili, Italian, doesn't matter if I'm, Su I'm, Su I'm, I'm, I'm out of, I'm out of countries. Come on here, guys. It doesn't matter where I'm from, it doesn't matter where, what side of the railroad tracks I'm on. Can I tell you, it has nothing to do with my race, it has nothing to do with who it is that I think that I am because I'm a particular color. I don't matter, it doesn't matter if I'm white, it doesn't matter if I'm black, it doesn't matter if I'm Chinese, it doesn't matter if I'm Japanese. There they go. Come on, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter who I am, I, it has nothing to do with my race. And we need to get this because oftentimes we don't think things like this is important until some of our, especially our young men, our young men are being picked off by this movement. You know why? Because they, they are, they are identifying with what they're saying because they come to our churches and they come and they come and they, they, they come with us and, they, and it seems like there's nothing for us to do. It seems like, man, we just here. We just here. Just like all the only superstar is the guy with the microphone. Oh, but can I tell you that's not, that's not how it is at Truth and Love Ministries, my friend. Oh, no, you can get, you get in where you fit in. We plug you in and here we connect people to God, connect people to God and connect this church to the community. It has nothing to do with my race. No, no, it don't. That's what Paul is saying. He says, because you think that you're right with God because of your race but you got a, you got another thing coming number three knowing Jesus has nothing to do with my prestigious family I know you come from the Kennedys I know I know you come from the Huxables I know I know you come from, from whomever it is that you come from look what Paul says of the tribe of Benjamin Paul, Paul said it's all about the Benjamin baby Paul said I'm from the tribe of Benjamin I come from a prestigious family a wide, widespread respected family admiration family that had a lot of admiration what, what am I saying a lot of people have in their heart and in their mind because they was because they they come from this particular place because my last name is 
is this or because my last name is that. That's why the hand of God is on me. Paul said none of that matters. He said knowing Jesus has nothing to do with my upbringing. Had nothing to do with my has nothing to do with my upbringing. I know you. I know you was you was born in church. You had somebody. Uh, when, when, when did you get saved? What what year did you get saved? Oh, I, I pretty much been saved all my life. <clears throat> You're not saved. <laughs> Y'all looking at me like that, like I don't know what I'm talking about. I kind of do this for a living. You know, I talk, I kind of talk to some of y'all. So, so here, wake him up. Come on, man. You can't be sitting playing the game all night and then come to church and got your head laid back. Come on, wake up, man. Here, can I tell you this? Sit right in front of you. Here, can I tell you this, my man? We know we good. We good, mama. We good, mama. I never heard that joke up, though. So anyway, so here, can I tell you that here what, what God is saying to us is that, is, that, is that it has nothing to do with my upbringing. And we feel as if because I was raised a particular way, because my mom was, because my, my daddy was a pastor or my grandmama was a this. So I've been in church all my life. What am I saying? You need to have a time. You need to have a, a space in your life to where you know. I know January. I, I know it's January 2001. I may not, can't tell you the exact date. I, I can't tell you the exact time. But I know it was January 2001. Something happened to me. If you can't point to a particular time, if you can't point to a, well, I was around 20 something. I was around 30 something. You don't got to give me the exact date. But can you tell me, can you tell me something other than you was brought up in church? Can you tell me something other than and the fact that oh you always been a member of church I always been right no my friend when you have a real head on collision with Jesus oh it'll change your life forever whenever did you have a head on collision with Jesus Christ you'll know that something you'll know that something that something is happening Lord Lord have mercy Paul Paul says it, it had nothing to do with my upbringing here he in his upbringing he had the best of upbringing and it has nothing to do knowing Jesus has nothing to do with my moral standard because there are some people that have moral standards. There are some individuals that because they live by particular code. Look what it says in verse 5. As a law of Pharisee. The Pharisees were the who's who with keeping the word and keeping the law and all of these different types of things. And there are some people. Can I say this to you? There are some people who will never step foot in the church. They have, a, have, a, have, a, have heavier convictions than some believers. There are some people who never step foot in church. There are some people that never, they never, they never confess the Lord Jesus Christ, but they'll never commit adultery. They'll never st- cheat on their taxes. They'll never do certain things. They have a, a moral code, and, and, they, and, and in their eyes, and in our eyes, we'll say they're good people. Oh, but can I tell you that good people go to hell too? Yes, sir. Can I tell you that firemen go to hell, and police officers go to hell, and brain surgeons go to hell, and pastors go to hell, and prophets go to hell, and our bishops go to hell? Y'all ain't gonna help me preach up in here. What am I saying? Has nothing to do with all the good stuff that you do. Has nothing to do about your moral code. Oh, I never talk back to my mama. Oh, but but you don't put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. It makes no difference about your moral code or your moral standard I gotta get you while I got you can I tell you here knowing knowing Jesus has nothing to do with how sincere I am and this is this is one of the most damning things in our day we tell people stuff like this just follow your heart just follow your heart whatever your heart tell you to do Follow your heart. Can I tell you that your heart, the Bible says, not Pastor Gold, but your heart is deceitful. Your heart is desperately wicked. That's the worst advice you can ever give somebody. You tell somebody to follow God. You don't follow your heart. You follow, if I follow my heart, there's a whole lot of stuff I ought to walk right out of my, my heart. Leave me. I'm going. I'm, I'm out of here then. Let me go. I'm going to follow my heart. But no, my friend, whenever it is that you follow God. I'm trying to do the best I can. The Resurrection Sunday. But, uh, here, here, here. No, knowing Jesus has nothing to do with how moral I am once again when I'm more he talks about how blameless he is and all these different things and here this is the point that I'm trying to make to all of us is that Paul brings this to the forefront because it's so prevalent in our day we are so used to this candy coated watered down gospel that whenever it is we hear the unadulterated word of God it just kind of just jars us it's like oh my god what is this oh what is he talking about why is he all up in my business I don't even know you boo boo come here why, why, why is it why is it that he did and why is it that because we're so used to hearing what we want to hear but can I tell you just because you got all these good things like Paul because you were born in the right family and you you got you point back to when you got baptized when you was 12 and you was christened when you were three and all these different things oh but can I tell you all those things may be good but can I tell you look what Pastor Kobe said a good thing becomes a bad thing if it becomes a substitute for the best thing Lord have mercy your good thing may be good but your good thing becomes a bad thing when it keeps you from the best thing all of those things don't mean anything until you put your faith in the Lord in the Lord Jesus Christ don't you put your faith in your good stuff don't you put your faith in your good family don't you put your faith in the fact that you live on the right side of the railroad tracks I'm telling you that God 
God. God, God wants you to have a head on collision with the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is what this series is all about. This series is not about us going to church and having church. This series is about us being the church and being the people of God. For too long, we've just been going through the motions. And God is calling us to be able to actually put into practice all these things that we've been knowing and hearing. And here, this is the point of the series. It's just simply to convert non-believers into disciples. That's what I'm after today. That's why I'm coming with the word. That's why I'm coming with the God. I'm, tr- I'm after those folk who don't know the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm after those folk who, who just simply, who just simply ha- have, have, a, have a mental assent about the things of God. You've got certain facts about the Lord, but you have not become a believer. You have not, you don't meet the qualifications as relates to someone who put their faith in the Lord. Jesus Christ, I'm after you today. Or uh, someone in this room, somebody watching me, somebody in the parking lot, I'm after you today to be able to bring you into a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. The way you can save my friend without a shadow of a doubt that I know that I'm a child of God, that I know that I've been changed, that I know I've been washed, that I know I've been blood bought. Lord, have mercy. I can't get the believers to clap when I'm talking about what folk need to need to do. It's okay. <laughs> to convert, what, what, what am I after? To convert casual attendees into disciples. There are folk that are, that, are, that are children of God. They are, they're the people of God, but they're just casual attendees. They're not, they're not disciples. They, they, just, they just hang around. They hang around the things of God. But you do not, but not being a disciple, not being a disciple. What, what, what is, what is something after to convert disciples into disciple makers? See, see, you cannot, you cannot be a casual Christian. No, there's no such thing as a Christian who don't make disciples. There's no such thing as a Christian whose life is not disciplined towards the things of God. There's no such thing as a believer who just simply just loosely just follows God and do what they think they want to do and to be able to live at a particular way and do not govern their life according to the will and the word and see commentary like this this is this is is antiquated and outdated and we don't relate to this but this is the word of God my friend there's no such thing as an individual who's a child of God who don't serve God I'm trying to convert individuals who are disciples into disciple disciple makers and, and 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 to create and maintain a discipleship culture this, this, this is what this is what this series is about this is why that's why i went to the apostle paul i believe the lord led me to this philippian chapter three because paul is putting the hay down where the goats can get it paul is saying all this stuff that y'all think y'all are doing all this stuff that y'all think is important all this stuff that y'all think that y'all are doing it, it means nothing as relates to what being a true follower of christ is being a power being a true follower of christ jesus said this is what i almost preached jesus said anyone come after me must take up his cross can I get in your business for a second? I'm, and I'm getting out of here because I got a whole nother service. I'm, can I get in your business for a second? Can I say, what's your cross? How are you following Jesus? And you run from every little bit of suffering that you encounter. How are you following Jesus? And any little bit of accountability any little bit of uh, discipline, any little bit of pressing that we need to get in, we, we, we fall away from and we say that it's not, it's not important, but that's not what following Christ is about. I need to be a disciple. Somebody said that I need to be a disciple. I need, I need to be a disciple. So, so I told you, I didn't want to say that. I, 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 need, to be, I need to be a disciple. So, so here, let me help you. So, 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 so let me help you uh, as it relates to knowing. That's why I'm, pre- I'm preaching about him. Somebody say him, him, him. I'm, I'm preaching about him. I'm preaching about Jesus. So, so knowing him, come on, this is how you know who, who a believer is. Knowing him produces joy yeah. yes it does knowing him produces joy Philippians 3 1 Paul says finally my brothers he said rejoice in the Lord fi- fi- Paul says finally what you mean bro Paul Paul is this is the third chapter of this letter and Paul still got 44 more verses to go but just like a good preacher Paul says I'm getting ready to close but yeah he still got a whole lot more I don't know why that was so funny I just don't really know why that was so funny I'm just I'm just saying Paul says finally but he has 44 more verses what what is Paul saying Paul is resetting the atmosphere. Paul is getting ready to stay the point and Paul is transitioning to a major point and Paul is saying that here whenever it is that we understand what it is that God is desiring to do in our life, we will get to a place that where we allow our relationship with God to produce joy. What, what, what does he say my joy is? Come on, can you leave it on and put it on the screen for me please? What, what does he say my joy the, 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 the verse prior to Philippians chapter 3 verse number 1. Philippians chapter we go. What, what where, where is my joy? He said, Rejoice. In, where, where, where's the joy at? 
is in, in the Lord. And, and see, this is positional joy. He said, my, my joy is in the Lord. And this is where we miss it because we put our joy in our relationships. We put our joy on our job. We put our joy in our children. We put our joy in all these other things. And when those things are gone, so is my joy. But Paul said that I need to learn to rejoice in the Lord because the Lord, he's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. He's not changing. So when my joy is in him, you can leave me, but I still got my joy. When my joy is in him, you can fire me, but I still got my joy. When my joy is in him, oh, the doctor can shake his head, but I still got, I still got joy. I'm trying to do the best I can here. I'm trying to tell you, joy, joy, joy has nothing to do with my circumstances. This is how I know you're a true believer. That you don't look like what you've been through, Lord. This is how I know you're a true child of God. That man, when you start running down your resume and you still got a smile in your face, you still got a worship in your heart, you still got a praise and you got to get out. This is what joy looks like. This is how I know, this is how I know you're a child of God. It has nothing to do with your circumstances. I love this. I love this because Paul is, Paul is really trying to get our attention. Paul is really trying to get our attention. He wants, to, he wants to remind us what a true child of God looks like. And I'm challenging you today on what a true child of God looks like. A, a true child of God, when I know him, when I know him, it, it produces joy. It was a great, a great Christian teacher who's now deceased. He, he lived on the, in a hillside by the college that he taught. His home was, was, was simple, had all of his little family heirlooms and all these things that him and his wife treasure and value in such a way they were so excited about what they had and what God had done in their life but one day their, their house caught on fire and they didn't have time to grab any of the family albums they had no time to grab any of grandma china dishes they had no time to be able to grab any of his car collection all the things that he had they had no time to grab it all oh but the man looked at his wife as they were hurrying out the house before the house went up in flames she, he looked at his wife and said baby do you got your joy Lord hammer do you do you got your joy don't forget the joy Come Come on, all the house can go up in smoke, but don't forget your joy. Everything else, the repo man can come hit you my little hoop the up, but don't forget your. I wish I was preaching in here. I'm trying to do the best I can. <laughs> Why are you yelling at me, Miss Ruth? Look, here, look. Look, look. <laughs> don't forget. <laughs> Yo, don't forget your joy. Don't forget your joy. When I got joy, I'm not concerned about all these other things. When I got joy, let me, let me hurry and get to what I'm trying to tell you. Because joy is closely related. Now we can put that definition up. It's closely related to gladness and happiness. Come on. Although joy is more of a state. Come on. A state of being than an emotion. Joy is a result of a choice. I choose to have joy. I choose to have some joy. It has nothing to do with my emotions. My emotions are all over the place. It has nothing to do with what's going on in my life, but I choose to have joy. That's why every day I wake up, I say, this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice. I make up in my mind to rejoice, and I'm going to be glad there is. Everything around me telling me to cry. Everything in me telling me to quit. Everything in me telling me doesn't matter, but I choose because I still got my joy. I gotta get out of here. Let me get out of here. Here's my church. I've been looking for my church for 27 minutes. There y'all go. Appreciate y'all. I was wondering if I left y'all at 10 o'clock. I was trying to figure out where y'all was at. There y'all go. Look here. Jo joy. I still, I still got, I still got. See, some of us, this is such a, a relevant word. Some of us, our souls are saved. But our faces. Y'all don't believe me. Look, y'all don't believe me. Proverbs 15, 3. Proverbs 15, 3. Come on, give me that. First 15, 13, rather. 15, 13. No, no, yeah, there you go. You're you good. A, a, a glad heart makes a... Some of us, our souls are saved. Our faces need to be saved. But when you got joy... 
oh, it makes it makes a cheerful face. Eh? Oh, but sorrow of the heart makes the makes the spirit is cr- look look at look at it. Was said same verse in the message said a cheerful heart brings a smile to your face. Lord, I'm not I'm not just talking about just cheese and just be cheesing. No, I'm talking about a state of mind. I'm talking about making a choice. I'm talking about the way I got reason to be crying my eyes out too. I got reason to be depressed too. I got reason to be feeling all this pressure, all this anxiety too. But I choose, I choose to put a smile on my face. Y'all look at your neighbor and say, your faith, your, your faith, don't say it. Y'all, y'all, yeah. Some of us, these masks helped us for a season. But some of us, our, our, our smile or lack thereof has matriculated to our eyes and you still can see them eyes cutting and looking all, looking all across. Our, I'm just talking about who I'm talking about here. Can I tell you? Here, your, your eyes can tell, tell, tell all over, tell, tell everything about you. Some of us, your soul going to be in heaven, but your face. <laughs> Lord, save my face, Lord. Save my, save, save my face, Lord. Save my face. Help, help, help. Let me help you. Proverbs 17, 22. Look what it says. A cheerful heart is good medicine. And even our laughing, and even us being jovial, and even me sliding jokes in and all that, you'll be surprised at religious people that say, that's just too much playing. Ain't nothing, but ain't, nothing, ain't nothing that funny. Oh, oh, no, oh, no, no. But here, and this is why individuals are, are hurting so. This is why individuals are so overwhelmed because you can't laugh about nothing. You, you, you're so serious. Why you take yourself so serious? And God said in his word, a cheerful heart is a good medicine. Oh, but a broken spirit saps a person's strength. And this is why so many things zap us and get us to the place where we don't have our joy and our peace because we don't know how to enjoy what it is that we have. But if I'm a true follower of Christ, I knowing Jesus here knowing him produces joy but secondly knowing him it is oh my God it is to be his protege Lord have mercy knowing him is to be his protege Philippians 3 1 one more time Paul said finally my brothers rejoice where in the Lord he says to write the same things to you look what Paul says is no trouble to me and he says it's safe for you Paul says I've told y'all this before I have no problem telling you again. Paul didn't mind people telling him, we heard that already, Paul. <laughs> we, we already heard that, man. Pastor, Pastor and preach this already. All my old note takers, I can't stand y'all. All the little note takers will be right there. Really. You preach, you preach this. One on Main Street, August the 14th, 23rd. All you did was switch the title around a little bit. But it's the same thing. I only get one Bible to preach out of. You try preaching seven times a week and try to come on. You're like, you ain't going to stumble. It's a sa- I don't care how many resurrection Sundays we kill. And he still got out the grave on the third day. I-, I don't care how many Palm Sundays they are. He still came riding in. I don't care how many Christmases we get. He still was born of a virgin. The story does not change. But the problem is we want to go to something new and we have not grabbed what we already got. But Paul says, it's no problem for me to tell you the same thing again and again. We heard that already, Pastor. We already had this year. We already did this. We already did that. We heard all this. But Paul said, don't bother me to tell you the same thing again. He said, it's safety for you. It's, it's safety for you. In other words, you and I, we're guarded by good teaching. Lord have mercy. Whenever it is that I'm under good teaching, that's why it does matter where you connect it. Because when I'm up under good teaching and I make application to that teaching, it keeps me out of mess. It keeps me out of drama. It keeps me out of some things that other people get themselves into. It does matter where you get the word. Paul says... When I get the word, I'm literally, I'm, I'm God is literally discipling me. I'm literally being God's protege. Protege, just another word for disciple. It's a person that is guided by someone, supported by someone, influenced by someone. And that's what Paul is saying. Paul is saying, when you receive the word, you don't mind hearing the same thing over and over again. I love what Patrick Lencioni says. He says, repeating yourself constantly to reinforce culture and mission. We have to learn to repeat ourselves constantly to reinforce culture and mission and see some of us this is why some of our houses are tore up because you feel like because you had a conversation one time you think everything's supposed to get in line no you got to keep on telling that booger again and again and again you got to keep on telling your children again and again and again you got to keep on saying the same thing over and over and over and over and over again and finally they'll get what it is that God is trying to say let me go y'all don't like me 
A silent house is an unsuccessful house. You got to keep on talking, my friend. You got you to gotta keep on talking. Come on, come on, fathers, all my men. Come on, you just can't let, you can't let mama do everything. What your mama say? What's your mama? Go, go, go to your mama. What your, what your mama say? Don't ask me. I don't know watching TV. Don't ask your mama. No, a silent father is a failing father. You got to be able to speak up. I tell my kids with a heartbeat. I tell I don't stress my wife out. You're not going to stress her out. And I, I be all the way on the other side of the house. Yes, ma'am. Come on, then she's not even talking to me. I don't even know what they're talking about. All I, uh, she may have said, yes, ma'am. I didn't hear her. Yes, Yes, ma'am. And I hit them just when they looking crazy. Go, don't be looking at my wife like that. I snatch her hair at you. That's my wife. <laughs> I don't stress her out. I don't fuss with her. You're not going to have all, 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 all. I go When I want to fuss, I go in the room and look at the picture and say, I told you, woman. I want to look at the picture. That's why I got the picture up on my phone. It's not because I, she's so beautiful. I want to fuss. Told you, girl. So tired of you, I don't know what to do. Hey, baby. Hey, baby. You got to get it all out on the phone. Don't take it out on them. Yeah. Help your house, I'm trying to tell you. Get it out on the phone. Look, knowing him... <laughs> Produces joy. I got Brother Head and laughing on that. I know I'm rolling, boy. Brother Head and laughing. I know I'm doing good. All I see, <laughs> he back here. <laughs> Knowing him produces joy. Knowing him causes me to be his protege. Knowing him, look at this, causes me to be perceptive. Per perceptive. Look what Paul says. I'm talking about what a real believer looks like. He says it calls me to be perceptive. Look, look, look at Philippians 3.2. This is going to be deep. Look at it. He says, look out. He said, look out. So, 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 so here, here's our problem. We come to the house of the Lord. We get filled up, fired up. We get the word of the Lord. And then we walk out into the world. And we don't keep our head on the proverbial swivel. We get encouraged. You get encouraged today. You're laughing today. You're having a good time. So I say, oh, I was church. Oh, we had a good time and all that. But here, no, you got to keep on looking out. Paul said that knowing him calls it perceptive. Look, look at it. Calls me to be perceptive rather. Perceptive simply means having or showing acute insight. In other words, God is sending us out into the world. Not to be gullible or not to ignore what's going on. But we ought to have some insight on what's going on. We ought to know what's going on. We ought to be able to encourage. We we ought to be able to speak truth to power. We ought to be able to give God to give us a word of wisdom. God to give us a word of knowledge. God to be able to speak some things to our hearts and we can have some wisdom and we can look out. We can look out for what is going on. And so many times we're so gullible and we're so naive. You're a corner boy. You're a corner girl. You're talking about all the stuff you used to do. But then when it comes to the house of the Lord, you don't know nothing. Just as sensitive as they come. But you was a goon. You got you got five teardrops on your face from all of the from all of the all of the whatever that means. Whatever that means, we got all them tears. Then something happened. I ain't going back. But you a goon. But you a thug. But you bought that life. But somebody didn't speak to you. Somebody sat in your seat. Y'all ain't going to talk to me up in here. <laughs> well, what am I saying? When we come to the house of the Lord, we get so sensitive. But God is telling us that we shouldn't walk that way. Well, look out and know the enemy is coming. The enemy is coming to snatch everything that's just been spoken. Oh, that's how it goes. The word, the word of God says when the sower was sowing the word of God. Oh, they're coming the bird, which is the enemy, and came and snatched that word. And that's what the enemy is doing. I'm not going to fuss with you today. I got, I'm getting this word. I'm not trying to argue with you today. I'm trying to get it. The devil is always trying, always trying to take what it is that God is giving us. Let me roll on, y'all. Y'all didn't come for this today for Resurrection Sunday. Come on here. Can I tell you what, what did Paul say? We ought to look out for look at look at Philippians 3 2 he said look out for the dogs he said, he said look out look out for the dogs who 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 let the, the dogs out who, 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 Paul, Paul, Paul said look out for those dogs he's speaking of wild dogs he's speaking of dog dogs was not like our dogs now our day and time we buy our dogs sweaters and bows and doggy beds and 
and, and they, we'd be in the car in our lap. They, they lick us in our faces and all that kind of stuff. We just all, all dogs go to heaven in our society. We let the dog get on the counter and lick out the bowl and stuff while we're cooking and all that kind of stuff. We all that kind of stuff. That's why you, that's why you don't got to eat from everybody's house. You know? And dogs and all that kind of stuff. Don't eat their food. Look, 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 I tell you, look. The dogs, the dogs in their day and time was not man's best friend. Y'all hear me? The dogs were, they roamed the streets. They were, they were scavengers. They roamed in packs. And they hunted, they hunted in the garbage. And they would bite you. And they were, they were wild animals in this day and time. So Paul is literally saying that these individuals that you need to watch out for, they rolling in packs. And they're snarling and they're growling. These are what they call Judaizers. These are individuals who, who simply, they wanted Jesus and the law. These are individuals, they see your joy. They see what God is doing in your life. But they snarl and they bite at you, telling you you can't or who you think you are. You were doing all that stuff last year and now you all say, now you all doing all, those are those are dogs. People are always come, Paul say, watch out for them dogs that's barking. Watch out for those individuals that want to have you to a place where you're falling back from what God has pulled you out of and you cannot let no one stop you from what it is that God is doing in your life. I don't care if you never affirm me. I don't, if you, I don't care if you never tell me I'm doing a good job. I don't care if you never tell me or that you see the change in me. I don't care if you ever tell me that you see the growth in me. I can't listen to all that barking. Oh, y'all to shh, be quiet. Tonight's the night we ride. We're going to throw those camouflage drummers, plug inside, rip choppers, going to do surgery on bodies like, hey, doctor, y'all don't know nothing about that. Can I tell you here, here? I do the best I can. He's going to jump that spirit and jump over here now. See, I say, yelling at me over here. It's on the wood. I appreciate it. That's good preaching right there. I like that. Come on, talk. Talk to me now. I'm just, I'm just playing. I talk to him now. Talk to him. Talk to him. No, no, knowing, no, no, knowing, knowing Jesus. Look what else Paul said we ought to look out for. He said, look out, look, three, Philippians 3, 2, look out for evildoers. These are people who say one thing and do something else. Evildoers. You, you would think he's talking about the dope man. You would think he's talking about the person that you know when you see them coming, they ain't, about no, they, they ain't, they ain't up to no good. Oh, I heard somebody who helped me sideline preacher. He's talking about the church focus, who, who he's talking about. How, let me tell you, how more deceptive can the enemy do? Can the enemy be, rather? Not even good English, is it? <laughs> how more deceptive can the enemy be than to dress up in a blue pinstripe suit, put a microphone in their hand, and have them acting as if they're giving you the truth? See, if you see the enemy with a pitchfork and, 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 and horns and a tail, you'll know that's the devil. You know that avoid, but to put a little suit on them man, and have them talking all church folk and talking all church talk. That's what Paul is calling evil doing. It's a church folk. Say one thing and do something else. Flipping three, two. I'm getting there, y'all. Look what he says. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. These all these circumcising folk, they were getting circumcised and just hurting themselves and bringing themselves under all of these types of religious rules and all these particular things. And they thought that this stuff made them who they were. And that's all pastor trying to tell you, my friend, today, that doing all those things does not make you be a child of God. You got to watch out for all these individuals. I cannot stop serving God because there's hypocrites. I cannot stop serving God because there's naysay naysayers. I cannot stop serving God because there's people barking in my ear. But I got to keep my face and my focus on the things of God because no matter what's going on around me I'm going to give God glory and honor knowing him let me roll knowing him oh is a posture our hearts in worship that's what a child of God looks like a child of God is one that had that in any way I know that it produces joy a child of God is one that becomes its protege a child of God is one that has perceptive it's perceptive oh but also I posture my heart in worship Paul said Philippians 3 3 he said for we of the circumcision who worship by the spirit of God Lord have mercy see I, how do I know you're a real child of God nobody got to pump you up to worship nobody got to coerce you to worship I don't got to give you a gift card to worship but you say I was glad when they said unto me let us go into the house of the Lord how do I know you're a true child of God when you enter into his gates with thanksgiving and you enter his courts with praise and you're thankful unto him and you bless his name Paul said worship is not a place that's what Jesus told that woman at the well come on you 
trying to worship at a plate. Worship is not a plate. Everywhere I am, I'm worshiping God. When I'm washing my dishes, I'm worshiping God. When I'm vacuuming my house, I'm worshiping God. While I'm on the folk job, I'm worshiping God. I got an altar in my heart. I'm always worshiping him no matter what it is. I'm doing worship is not a place. Oh, but true biblical worship is a lifestyle. True biblical worship, oh, is aligned with the truth. The truth of God's word. I can't worship God my way. Can I tell you there's not a black way to worship God? There's not a white way to worship God. There's a biblical way to worship God. You can't worship God your way. That's what Cain tried to do. You got to enter and do what God says. So why do we clap our hands? Because the Bible says so. Why do we stand on our feet? Because the Bible says so. Why do I lift up my voice? Because the Bible says so. Why do I holler every now and then? Because the word says so. Why do I dance? Why do I run? Why do I leap? Because the word says we all do. It's, it's, not, it's not about that's how them folk praise God. It's a biblical way. You got to watch yourself. It's a biblical way to praise God. Not your way. Oh, God help me. True biblical worship is a sacrifice. It's costly. It's going to cost you something. Every now and then you ought to be tired leaving the house of God. Every now and then you ought to be, you ought to perspire every now and then. Some of us would lift our hand if our fingers was on fire. Come on here, somebody. Some of us wouldn't stand up if, if we felt, uh, if we felt off and riders in our feet and when our foot is in. We wouldn't get up. But every now and then, y'all ain't going to help me preach up here. Every now and then, Lord have mercy. Let me go, let me go, let me go. I'm doing good. Knowing him, knowing him is to... Look at this. Knowing him is to be propped up by him. No, knowing him, he, he props me up. Yes, he does. And knowing him is it, to, it's to be propped up by him. Look what Philippians 3, 3 says. Paul says, not only are we worshipers, but look at this. And glory in Christ. I glory in Christ Jesus. I, I don't prop myself up. I prop him up. He's the one that props me up. That's what Paul is saying. I, I glory in Christ. That, that's what we ought to tell our children. You, you only got that tablet. You only got that game. You only got that phone because the Lord has been good to us. Come on, that's what we ought to do. You don't say, oh, I worked hard and I, you do all of that. That, 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 that. Let that be the second thing you say. But let the first thing you say, we got this house. We got this car. We where we are. Oh, because the Lord has been good. You ought to prop him up. You ought to brag on him. That's what Paul is saying. We ought to boast in him. What the boast is, boast is the show. All. Oh, we ought to show off verbally to brag, to speak aloud, or oh, to be loud tongued is what Paul is saying. When somebody asks you how you got that promotion, the Lord, when somebody say how you built that house when you got the Lord, when somebody say how is it that you maintaining what you the Lord? I thought you were sick, the Lord. I thought you were depressed, the Lord. I thought something was going to the Lord. Blame it on the Lord. Oh, you ought to be on to brag on him. You ought to give him some glory for everything he's doing in your life. <laughs> Watch these folk. It's always taking the credit. Care how many degrees you got? I don't care how, how long you've been on the job. I don't care how much, how much tenure you got. Blame it. Blame it on the Lord because he's the one He's the one that's propping, propping me up. He's the one that's holding me up. Lord, everything I know, he taught it to me. Everything I have, he gave it to me. Wherever I am, he may, I'm not a self-made man. I'm a God-made man. See how countercultural that is? That's why we need the gospel. The Bible says, knowing him, this past the Bible didn't say this, this is my point. Knowing him is to be, look at this, positioned in his ability. Yeah. Yep, this is knowing him. Be positioned in his ability. Here, here it is. Uh, Flipping 3 3. It's the last part of the verse. I'm going to read. I, I, it's all in the verse I've really been in all day, y'all. I just been, I just broke them down. Uh, for, for we are the circumcision. That means the people of God. See, the, see, true, true people of God is not circumcision on the outside. It's circumcision where? Of the heart. Of the heart. So we are the circumcision. We, we worship God. We, we glory in Christ. And here it is. Put no confidence in the flesh. This is why some of us get ourselves in trouble. I can handle it. This is how some of us get ourselves in trouble. I'll be good. I'm okay. Then somebody check you. Chop judge you and me. No, 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 no. Come on, Mr. and Mrs. Muchy Suchy. Put no confidence in the flesh. 
I, I must always be on guard. I must always know that the enemy is looking to steal, to kill, and destroy. I must always know that the devil is not trying to make me happy. The devil is not trying to give me something to satisfy my needs. The devil is not trying to give me something to make things easier. If he ever gives me something, he's just trying to put a hook in my nose and a hook in my mouth so I can be in bondage and be away from the plan and the purposes of God. I cannot put no confidence in the flesh because the Lord is the one that's going to kick me. The Lord is the one that's going to help me. Oh, can I tell you to put your hands together and give God some praise in this place. I'll see y'all next service. I'm getting ready to roll. Get ready to roll up out of here. I see the lights are flashing. I got the plane on the runway. I've been cleared. I've been cleared to take off. I'm getting ready to get up out of here. Look what Paul said in Philippians 3, 7. He said, but whatever, he said, whatever gain I had, he said, I counted, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. What you mean, bro, pastor? Paul said, I counted it, I counted it as loss. My ceremony, it was a loss. The race I was born in, it's a total loss. My prestige, my pedigree, my practice, my morality, my sacrifice, it's all a loss. So this is what I'm trying to tell you. When you're a true follower of Christ, when you cash it all in, see at one time in Paul's life, he counted all those things he did with being right with God. He said, I'm right with God because of the family that I'm in. I'm right with God because I've been circumcised the eighth day. He said, I'm right with God because of all of what he did. So he took all his good and cashed it in. And you know what? When I follow God, I got nothing to lose. Y'all ain't gonna help me preach in here. What you mean, bro, pastor? I'm gonna serve him because I got nothing to lose. I'm gonna worship him because I got nothing to lose. It's my last thing, y'all. God bless you. Knowing him is to know him personally. Y'all don't know when to get happy. See, knowing him is to know him personally. He's not the man upstairs. He's not the big guy. That's my Lord. That's my Savior. That's my Father. I heard Paul say, we have not received the spirit of bondage whereby we can cry. We have not received the spirit of bondage unto fear, but I receive the spirit of adoption whereby I can cry, Abba. He's my daddy. He's my father. I know him personally. Look what Paul said. Philippians 3, 8 says, Indeed, I count some things as a loss. I count most things as a loss. I count the bad things as a loss. He said, I count everything. Even the good thing. It's a total loss. Even those things I did on my own. When it comes to the cross, it's a total loss. Oh, he said, I count everything. I suffer loss. And I count it all as rubbish. I count it all as dung. I count it all as manure. Because I got to gain. I got to gain Christ. Y'all ain't going to help me preach in here. I give him all of this just for that one thing. I give him all of that for that one thing. I give him that man. I give up that job. I give up that career. I give up everything for that one thing. Can I tell you when the Lord for real though I'll give it all up I'm chasing after knowing him I'm chasing after being in his family I heard Paul say look at verse 8 again he said because of the surpassing worth why you gonna give it up because he's worth it he's worth it all for knowing Christ Jesus as my Lord knowing him experientially I messed that up I can't say Constantinople knowing him is to experience him knowing him is to know him personally knowing him is to know the Lord is my Lord and my Savior is there anybody in here that know the Lord personally is there anybody in here that say I know I know I've been changed I know he took a work he did a work in me I heard 
Jesus say, my sheep hear my voice and I know them. Thank you. He said, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. I heard Jesus say in John 17, 3, in this is eternal life that they know you, that they know the Father, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you sent. I heard Paul say, 1 John rather, 5, 20, and we know that the Son of God has come and given us understanding so that we may know him. That's why Jesus came, so we can know the Father. That's why he came through 42 generations, so we can know the Father. That's why Jesus was hung up for our hangups. That's why Jesus was wounded for our transgression. That's why Jesus was bruised for our iniquity. That's why Jesus had nails in his hands, nails in his feet, a crown of thorns on his head. That's why he went through what he went through. That's why he died. Didn't he die? I said he died. He stayed dead all night Friday. He stayed dead all day Saturday. I've been waiting on this for a while. But early, y'all are gonna help me preach in here. I said early, early Sunday morning. He got up with all his hand and because he got up I can get up because he rose I can rise because he came out I'm coming out I'm stepping out I'm praising out I am giving him my best because I got nothing to lose somebody say yeah I got nothing to lose, so I don't got to wait till the battle is over. I can praise him right now. I got nothing to lose. I'm going to give him everything, all my energy, all my time, all my effort. Yes, Lord. On behalf of everyone at Truth and Love Ministries, we want to thank you for joining us for our virtual worship experience. We want to thank you for your likes and your shares, your comments and your emojis. But we also want to invite you to partner with us as we continue to be the hands and the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ. You do know that he told us that we ought to feed the hungry, we ought to clothe the naked, and we ought to be the church. And you can help us to continue to do just that through your generosity. And there are three easy, safe, and secure ways that you can do just that. You can text the word T-I-L-JAX, one word, T-I-L-JAX, to the number 77977. You can go to our website, www.truthandlove.tv, or you can go to the Apple Store or the Google Play Store, search for Truth and Love Jax, download our app, and you can give that way. We thank you for your participation. We thank you for your generosity, and we love you, and we'll see you next time. Here comes the church. God bless you.